Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting in verse 3. Nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. You may be seated. It's a brand new year, and we are excited. I think this is going to be a great year. We want to say welcome to everybody, especially to our guests. If you are a guest, you got one of those uh, attendance cards inside that packet. Would you please pass that to the inside aisle and be picked up at this time? For about 25 years, and that is the lesson for tonight, Let's see. Yeah, that is the lesson for tonight. We need to uh, switch. That is not the lesson for today. The lesson for the day is the one that has the marriage thing on it. So as you're searching for that back there, uh, I will keep on talking here. And hopefully you can find that. Because I will need that uh, PowerPoint. That lesson is called The Greatest Gift You Can Give Your Children. That is the lesson that you're looking for. The lesson that was up there is the one for this evening. Now, for about 25 years, for about 25 years, I have been blessed to, and that is still the lesson for this evening there. For about 25 years, I've been blessed to work with young preachers. I've actually uh, mentored several young preachers in my lifetime, and that has been a true joy for me. I have really, really enjoyed that. Near the end of 2022, I was asked to join 51 other preachers and uh, compile a series of lessons, a series of sermons, 52 sermons in total. These 52 sermons will be printed in a book and will eventually be given out to young preachers to help them. Uh, and that's the one right there. Okay, hey, bingo, you got it. Uh, we're now back on track. And these 52 sermons will be printed in a book and be given to young preachers to help them to see what can be done with these 52 subjects. The subject assigned to me was this subject, the greatest gift that you can give your children. You know, we always want to give our children great gifts. We just got through a time period in our calendar that we gave gifts to people. And we especially enjoy giving gifts to our children. So what is the greatest gift you can give your children? You know, this really ties in with a series of lessons that we did uh, at the end of last year. Remember that series about your five? And I don't know who you have on your list of those five people that you dearly love and you want them to become a Christian. But I can guess. I can guess that if you have a child or a grandchild who is not a faithful Christian, that child or grandchild is part of your five. In fact, what we want to see, we want to see our children and grandchildren remain faithful from baptism all the way to the grave. We want them to die as faithful Christians. So how do we do that? How do we give them a gift of faith? What, what things can we do? that will increase the probability of them being faithful Christians. I believe there are some things we can do. Now, life today, marriage today is different from what it was in the Bible days. Marriage in the Bible was done mostly by prearrangement. 
uh, the parents would prearrange the uh, the bride for the for the son, and it was done between the parents. We don't do that today in our world. At least we don't do it here in this country. But it was certainly the way they did it back in the Bible days. Let me give you some examples. So how about Samson? Judges 14. Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughter of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. Notice, Samson didn't go out and arrange it. He was asking his mom and dad to arrange it because that's how they did it back then. That sounds weird to us, but that's how they did it back then. Even when you could not pinpoint the bride herself, you wanted to know her background, her family background. Abraham, what did he do in Genesis 24? He sent a servant back to his family roots to get a bride for Isaac. Now, he wanted to be sure that Isaac did not marry someone that was living around them. In other words, the Canaanites. Why? Because he didn't want that influence. He didn't want that sinful influence on his son. Later on, Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Jacob would be sent back to Abraham's family. Why? To find a bride. We're going to send you back there to find a bride. We don't want you to be marrying around here. We want you to go back and find a bride from our family's roots. Now, later on in the law, in the verse that was already read, it was very plain. You do not let your sons or daughters marry the Canaanites, marry the people around us. You don't let their influence impact your family because they will lead them away from God. Well, how about today? Because that was marriage in the Bible. Well, how about today? Well, I believe there's a tremendous need for parents to be involved. Definitely to be involved. Now, can you pick out a future bride or a future groom for your child? No, they're not going to let you do that. But you can certainly be involved. What do I mean? Well... I have 45 years experience in doing marriage enrichment. And I have pinpointed 10 big factors that will influence who your child marries. 10 big factors that will influence who your child marries. Factor number one, foundation. The foundation you give them as they are growing up in your home. Do they see God as your priority? Do they see that you make the Lord number one? It should always be Lord number one, your spouse number two, your children number three. Is God Number one, in your heart. Do they see how you put a priority on worship of God? Uh, how you put a priority on the God's, God's church? How you put a priority on living the Christian life? Is the only spiritual life they see what they see on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday evening? If they only see, that would be roughly about three and a half, four hours a week. That will make one week. And that's not W-E-E-K, that's W-E-A-K. That will make one spiritual week. 
Do they see how you make God a priority? What kind of foundation are you giving them? Number two, their friends. Are their friends Christians? Now, you can certainly influence the direction of your child's friends. You can push them, you can gently push them in that direction of having Christian friends. Do you make it easy and available for them to have Christian friends? Do you give them ample opportunities for activities that they will have with other Christian young people? Is their circle of friends Christians? They need to be Christians. Are you giving them the opportunity to have Christian friends around them? I know growing up, as my children were growing up, we made it a point. If our children wanted to invite Christian friends to our house, I don't remember ever saying no. I can't remember ever saying, no, we can't do that. Even if it was not convenient, even if it was going to be a little bit of a hardship, we made it possible. We wanted them to be around Christian friends. Factor three, the strength of the local church youth program. Here is two basic observations I have seen. Many youth programs fall into two categories. Category one is the one that you want. That's a spiritually uplifting, spiritually forming, spiritually blessing youth program. That's what you want to have. Category two, a glorified babysitter. Okay, I've seen that too many times. All the program was was a glorified babysitter. They did a lot of fun stuff, but there wasn't a lot of spiritually building opportunities available. Factor four. Billy, cover your ears. I'm going to talk about you. The influence of the youth minister. Now here, we don't really have a youth minister. Billy has a lot of things that he does in the direction of youth, but we're both just ministers. But Billy has more opportunities to work with our youth. I love Billy because he wants to point our young people in the direction of God. I remember when my son enrolled as a college freshman. He will eventually become a, a counselor of youth. But he started off being a youth minister manger. So we're sitting in a big room and we're having freshman orientation and I'm looking around at about a hundred other young men. And I'm going to tell you right now, I would not want 90 of them to be my child's youth minister. I saw immaturity. I saw weak faith. I asked one young man, why, why do you want to be a youth minister? Because it's an easy job. Is that a reason? No. But that's what I was seeing there. We are so fortunate to have that guy here helping our young people because his first priority is not the fun stuff, which he does offer fun activities. His first priority is spiritually building our children and grandchildren. We are so fortunate to have that guy here. And it's not just Billy, it's Brandy too. Her, her influence on our young ladies. You can't, you can't minimize what she does. Because that's so important. Factor five, the involvement of the eldership in shepherding the youth. Now, let me give you the good and bad. I have been at congregations where maybe a young person responded 
And most congregations, you have the elders down receiving. And I would have an elder say, now, who's this child? Uh, who's this uh, daughter of? Who's this a son of? Because they had no idea who that was. These men here are taking an active role in shepherding our young people. They're actually going to the classes, teaching classes. They're reaching out to them. They are involved. I give credit to Billy to inviting them in, but I give even more credit to the elders for accepting that. Because let's face it, that is not the easiest job to do. It's not the easiest job to do when you're, say, 50, 60, 70 years old and trying to relate to someone who is a teenager. It's a little hard. It's a little bit of a challenge. It'd be easy for these men to say, no, we don't want to do it. We won't do it. But they have said yes to this opportunity. Let me encourage you as parents and grandparents to encourage these elders to continue doing what they're doing, because to me, it's exciting. It's exciting. Factor six, if they go to college or they go to a, a Votech school or wherever, where they attend and who will be their college friends will be a factor that will influence their faithfulness. Now, you can certainly impact this one. When my children were looking at colleges, I, I was very open and honest with them. I said, hey, guys, financially, I'm going to help you if you go to any of these schools. I had a list. Anything off this list, that's going to be yours. Guess what? They chose the school on my list, okay? You know, they say, hey, dad's going to help us financially over here. He's not going to help us over here. Hey, that's how I felt about it. If I was going to put money into it, I wanted a say where they went. And I said, here's a list. You pick. Anything off that list, you know, there's student loans you can do, but it's going to be your responsibility. I wanted to get them into an atmosphere that would be an atmosphere that would help them to grow spiritually. Because I realize that at a college like that, the people that would be their college friends would be more likely to be Christians. I wanted them to be surrounded by Christians. Factor seven. Here's the first one that you don't have a big impact on. Their occupation and their work friends. You don't have a big impact on this one. But here's what I did. I started praying about this when my children were little. I prayed that they would end up in an occupation that would help them to grow spiritually. And they would have people around them that would help them to grow spiritually. I realized it was going to be their choice. I realized that. But still, I prayed about it. How many times did I pray? I prayed daily for years and years and years because I believe in the power of prayer. And guess what? My prayers were answered. They were answered. Factor eight. Factor eight. Where they live as adults. Once again, this is not one that you're going to have a lot of direct impact on. This is one that I prayed about. Because where they live, we're talking about how strong is the church there. You know, we are, we are fortunate. We're here in the Bible Belt. And we've got a lot of great congregations here in the Bible Belt. If you go up to the northeast or go to the northwest, if you go into the extreme parts of our country, the church is not as strong in those areas. Where they live is going to have an impact on their spiritual life. Once again, this is one that I committed to prayer. I said, God, 
I, I don't know where they're going to live when my kids are as, as adults, but I pray that they live close to a strong congregation. Factor nine, their habits and interests. You know, your habits and interests can pull you either closer to God or pull you away from God. You can influence this one by certainly inviting them into hobbies and things that will be spiritually enriching. But I realize, you know, the bottom line is they're going to have to make their own choices of the hobbies and habits and interests that they have. So this is one that I, once again, I committed to prayer. You know, I invited them into things that would certainly be hobbies and interests that they could you know, be spiritually bonding with them. We shared a lot of good books, a lot of good spiritual books. We did it as a family. But still, I realized, you know, that's going to be their choice. So I prayed about it. I prayed about it. Factor 10, but actually I call factor 10, factor 1A, who they marry. Who they marry is a big influence on their spiritual life. Who they marry will have a tremendous impact on their faithfulness. The person you marry can either pull you closer to God or pull you away from God. Now, you may be saying, I can't influence who my children marry. If you take that attitude, guess what? I'm going to tell you, you're wrong. You're wrong. You can certainly influence who your child marries. How? By really two ways. By encouraging, by encouraging your child to date Christians. By encouraging your child to date Christians. And number two, by setting the right marital example in front of them. Let's talk about number two first. How do we set the right marital example? How do we promote godly marriages? We promote godly marriages by setting a good example of what it means to have a godly marriage. Do they see demonstrated true godly love 24-7 in your home? I can fool you because you're only around me about four or five hours a week. I can fool you because you don't know what I'm like behind my walls at home. But guess what? My children knew exactly who I was at home. They knew exactly what kind of person I was. And did I show, did I demonstrate true godly love 24-7? Did they see me loving their mom the way a Christian husband should love his wife. Did they see their mom loving her husband the way a true Christian wife should love? Let me encourage you. Coming up on February 14th, we start a new series every day, Two Minutes to a Better Marriage. Will you invest two minutes to make your marriage better? If you have a great marriage, we're going to make it greater. If you have a good marriage, we're going to make it better. If you have a marriage that's maybe having a few bumps and, and twists along and things kind of don't go as smooth as it should, this will help you because we're going to give you in two-minute form little tips that can help you to have a better marriage. You want to demonstrate in front of your child what it means to have the marriage of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul demonstrates what it means to have a good godly marriage, a wife in submission, a husband who is sacrificially leading the family, leading his wife. 
two people who are actually one. We want to see that happen. Join me every day beginning February 14th. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded in you also. Notice genuine faith. Our children know the real you. They know the real you. You can't fool them. Is your faith genuine? Are you setting that godly example? We have so many verses. I have listed 12 verses here about the power of example. Let's look at one. Philippians chapter 4. The things which you learned and received, notice, it's things that you have learned, you received them. How? You heard and saw in me. You heard it from my own mouth. You saw it demonstrated in me. These do, and the God of peace will be with you. Can we say to our children, copy me as I'm walking for the Lord? Could we say that to our children? Just follow in my steps because I'm walking for the Lord. Do your children see the benefits of a Christian marriage in your marriage? Here's your homework. I'm going to give you homework for this week. Write down the benefits of a Christian marriage in contrast to a non-Christian marriage. Write down the benefits. By the way, I've been working on my list the past three days. I have so far 96 benefits listed on my paper. See if you can outdo me. I see so many benefits in a Christian marriage in contrast to a non-Christian marriage. You know, we have that song, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One. As I have made my list, it's made me appreciate Lisa more. It's made me appreciate marriage more. It's made me appreciate my God even more. I'm going to say to you, as you make your list this week, you're going to appreciate your spouse even more. You're going to appreciate your marriage even more, and you will appreciate your God even more. Now, Let's talk about this one. The first step I mentioned was encouraging our children to date Christians. I believe this is important. I believe it's important to encourage our children as they are growing up in our homes to date Christians. I want to give you a fact. Your children will marry someone they dated. That's a fact. You know, in our country, in our world today, uh, we're going to end up marrying someone we have dated. Would you want your child or grandchild to marry the person they're dating right now? If you answer no, why are they dating that person right now? You want to encourage your child to date a Christian. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. When you get married, that's being yoked together. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness now this could be right it could be compared to friendships whatever but right now i'm looking at this and comparing it to marriage do i know christians who married a non-christian and that christian converted the non-christian yes i do i know many Christians who married a non-Christian who ended up converting their spouse to Christianity. But here is the fact. For every one good example that I can give you 
of a Christian marrying a non-Christian and converting them to Christianity, I believe I can give you 10 examples of where a non-Christian pulled the Christian away. It has happened even in my family. I can look at my extended family and see that of family member, my extended family, and them marrying a non-Christian, and now they're no longer faithful. We want to increase the odds of probability. This is all, it's all the odds of probability. The odds of probability of your child marrying a Christian and having a good Christian home is much improved if they marry a Christian. The probability odds are just in your favor. Let me even add this. I, for one, I believe in group dating. Now, what's group dating? You know, our children, they want to start dating. You know, that's just, you know, they want to do it. And, you know, they want to start even at a young age. I realize that. Also, I realize there's such a thing called temptation. And when you take a young person with another young person by themselves, especially in a dark area, temptation can come knocking. And things can happen that you should not do as a Christian. That is kind of taken care of if you involve yourself in group dating. What is group dating? That is four or five or six couples, whatever it might be, going out on a date together. Maybe you go to see a movie together. Maybe you go to a restaurant together. But see, it's, it's numbers. You've got couples, but there are numbers. You've got two, three, four, five, six couples all going out and having fun together. That's group dating. That eliminates that one-on-one -on -one isolation that can cause temptation to happen. Furthermore, is a person they're dating a strong Christian? Is a person they're dating a strong Christian? Before I started dating Lisa, I was dating another person, and I thought she was a strong Christian. I found out that she was not a strong Christian when she suggested things that a Christian should not be doing. You see, just because they say they're a Christian doesn't mean they're a strong Christian. Well, how do you know they're a strong Christian? Encourage devotional time during each date. I believe in this. If you can't have a little devotional time in your date, how can you ever expect to have devotional time in your marriage, in your family? So have some devotional time. You know, maybe in the date with a little Bible study, put some prayer together. You see, you're setting, you're setting a habit, a habit that will grow from your dating years to your marriage to your family, wouldn't you love to have that spiritually experience every day with your kids? When you're gathering together around the table, you're opening up God's Word and you're studying God's Word and you're praying and you're praising God? It should start in the dating years. In the dating years, encourage devotional time during each date. Now, I want to take just a few moments here. I want to talk to the unmarried. Why would someone want to get married? When I do pre-marriage, when I do pre-marriage enrichment, sometime during that enrichment, I will ask the question, why do you want to get married? Why do you want to get married? And I've had many people give me different answers. Probably the most common answer is, well, I just love him. I just love her. That's a good answer. Or I'll have someone say, we're just so compatible. Well, that's a good answer. They'll say, well, they're so much fun to be with. Well, that's a good answer. 
But it's not the best answer. What is the best reason to get married? Because you found a person who will help you on the road to heaven. You have found a person that will help get you to heaven. Well, that's the reason to get married. You found that person that you want to live your life with because they're going to help you get to heaven. That's the best reason to get married. Because you have found a person that will help you get to heaven. You know, as parents, we want our children to be faithful from the day they're baptized all the way to the grave. If we will take to heart some of these factors, if we will encourage them by our example, if we will help them to find a good Christian person to date, if we will encourage them in that dating, if they will make God a priority even in their dating years with that devotional time, then the probability goes up. And folks, I like it when it's high probability. I don't like it when it's a low probability. I want to see my children and my grandchildren at that high probability of faithfulness. I don't want to see them at the low probability of faithfulness. Do all you can to encourage your child in the direction of God. And do all you can to encourage your child to get involved in the youth program. To not just be on the outside, but be on the inside. Get them involved in Lads to Leaders. By the way, this is the last day to sign up for that. And get that discount for us, for the church. Get them involved. Get them involved. Make God that priority. And let's give our children the greatest gift that we can ever give them. That is a life of faithfulness. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, why are you not a Christian? Why are you waiting? Do you believe? Will you repent? Will you confess? Will you be baptized? Pretty simple steps, is it not? As a Christian, do you need to seek forgiveness? The church stands ready to pray with you and for you. Will you take that step? In just a moment, we're going to be singing a song to encourage you, to encourage you to make that decision. We're going to have elders down here waiting for you. Is your heart right with God? Are you ready to make that step? Will you please come as we stand and sing for your encouragement? And, uh...